Hello, Pari. Hi, Andoni. Hello, Danny. Hello, guys. So today you have uh, another guest. We have uh, Danny coming in from Berlin, uh, I shall say. Uh, Danny is a startup um, uh, advisor and growth advisor as well. Um, we have a connection with a lot of startups, but I think that uh, you can share a bit more about what you do on a day to day and then we can uh, take it from there. Yep. Let's do that. So basically right now I work independently as an advisor and I consult startups and founders on how to grow their business, which mm -hmm. is a very generic thing, but it's mostly focused on product work and growth work because this is what I've been doing professionally in my career for the last 10 years before I decided to move into full-time advisory role. Mm -hmm. So product management is my craft and a lot of companies that I work with, they are product companies. So the, the thing that they offer the service is the digital product itself. So I can tell them how to grow with product-led growth, how to do acquisition, how to do pricing monetization, how to structure their plans, how to work with retention and email, different advertising campaigns. So like it's a very big topic if you do it structurally and go through everything. And that's where I work with founders, usually around series A or seed stage, where I work with companies and help them go to the next level. So mm -hmm. that's a rough overview of what I mostly do as a like professional activities. Plus I also like, like the community. So like you do, you have a podcast and you organize a few things. I also like to give back to the community. So I have uh, my own course about leadership and product management, which uh, is actually launching this Thursday, which probably for the All people right. yeah, who are cool. listening would have happened already. And yeah, we'll see how it goes. Congratulations. Yeah, best of luck. Thank you. We will definitely have a link, uh, you know, in the in the Yeah, zones. we're probably gonna run it several times this year, so yeah, we can link it. Awesome, awesome. That's uh, that's pretty good. Uh, so, I mean, you said to yourself that this is like a very broad topic because, uh, I mean, I can think of uh, marketing aspect of it, you know, the product aspect of it, maybe the engineering. I don't know how. Of far. course, yeah. I mean, all the all those things when you're a very small company like a startup that's uh, you know just start trying to. St to find the first customers, it's uh, it's quite amazing. So, how do you balance, you know, between all these different uh, uh, things? How do you uh, do it? Well, I guess it so starts when you need to get your first paying customer, and this is the hardest part because you don't have a brand, you don't have a product, and it's probably if you have, it's worse than your competition unless you specialize on a very specific part. So, the difficult part is to get your first customer, and this is where you focus on. This is your main priority, I guess. Then. The tricky part is go from one customer to five customers. And this is where I try to find who is more likely to buy my product. So it's, an, we call it ICP, ideal customer profile. So it's not just random people. Like if you're working in an educational space, you could be having customers who are colleges, private schools, tutoring schools, but maybe also medical schools and driver's schools. And all of them are schools which are educational, but they're all different. And if you have a random collection of customers, it doesn't really help you because you don't know which features to build, what to prioritize. So the next big step is to find out who is your ICP, like one group that is very similar to each other in their use cases and focus on getting five of them and then mm -hmm. 25 of them and then 100 of them. So that's you know the milestones usually that all founders and companies go through at the very beginning. And uh, I mean, what do you find all those customers? How do you look for them? Well, it helps a lot when the founder has been doing something before in their life and they have some kind of business connections or community around them. So either people know them or they know people. Because if you're just starting, I'm like, you know, 18 years old, I don't know, but don't know anybody, it's really, really, really hard. So ideally, you have your own network. So if you've worked in an industry, let's say in the educational industry for 10 years and you've been a software developer or a, I know, VP of marketing and you know the industry and the problems, you know a lot of people there. Hopefully you change a few companies, you have some different colleagues or bosses or people from conferences. And there is, you know, one or 200 of people that you can reach out to and have a chat with them. And they will say yes. So the most difficult part is actually to get the meeting with a potential customer because most of the people say, no, I don't have time for you. <laughs> so if you have a network, that helps a lot. So that's the best part. You just ask your network and this is how you get your first customers. So it's mostly like friends that are willing to, to help you with your new product and try to, to see yeah. it. And then you uh, you slowly try to convert them into actual paying customers. Or Yes, yeah. Probably not friends as in a casual way that people you hang out with and go into a bar, but more of a professional colleagues that share the same interest as you do. So I had, I had a question about that. I remember I was... You, you gave a talk a few months ago that I was there and I... I asked you a question about how 
I mean, what is it that you can do? Because I think you had a diagram about how hard it is to go to product-led growth. And I was asking you, asking you about the first part, which is the most dangerous, which is exactly what you said right now, to get your first customers, which is one of the most difficult parts. And I asked you what you can do as a startup founder there to give you the best chances that you can. And one of the things that you said was, is that this is a time where you have the opportunity to do things that do not scale. Because when you have tens of thousands of, of, you know, of users, you, you simply cannot go and email each one of them with a personal email and do all that stuff. And this is super useful. But I had a few other questions that I wanted to ask. Okay. And I will take the opportunity to ask you here. Let's... So I shared this here because for me, this is something I support that I has reused after you shared it. Oh, right. Yes, because w- when I talk with people, for example, we do I talked um, I talked to you about a new project that we have with a new startup that started and um, we are doing the implementation for them. And um I said to them in actually um, yesterday evening, we talked and they asked me how we can, you know, get started. And I, I, I spoke to them about this exact thing that this is the point where you can do all the things that do not scale. But I didn't have the answer about what you can avoid to that usually leads to failure. So you've seen different startups that have failed because of how they treat their product and their business. And so can you see a common denominator about early startup failures? Yeah, I guess one thing comes to my mind, which is uh, not a nice thing to, to hear for founders because it's building a product the way you see it. Hmm. rather than building a product that customers will need. And mm-hmm. I can give you an example that if you're solving a problem in the medical space and you're working with doctors and you, think, and you say, I think healthcare and doctors should work like that. And you build a product based on your ideal, maybe a little bit perfect, perfect understanding of how the space should behave. Mm-hmm. But that's what you have in your head. It's an imaginary place. It doesn't exist. In reality, you have real doctors who work in a real <coughs> workspace and they have constraints and limitations and legacy code and governments and so on, which is impossible to change. You can improve it. So those founders who are building a product based on their understanding how things should work, more likely to fail than those who actually talk to customers and say, okay, what do you need in your job? How can I help you? Because you people who build products for others are way more successful than people who build the products they have in mind. Mm. And I think if it's a, like a, it's a big generalization, but um, it's like you know, if you want to de- develop a mobile game, don't develop a game that you want to develop. Develop a game that will create a lot of fun and entertainment for others. Mm. Make a game if you're an entertainer. Same with the product. Create a product if you want to serve people and help them rather than you have your own idea about the product. That's usually doesn't lead anywhere. So you, so usually it's, uh, you, sorry, you talk about ego getting in the middle usually. Yeah, and that's why founders are people with vision, with bold ideas and say like, I want to change the world. I want this thing to exist. And I came up with it or some parts of it. I want to build it like it is. And that's their creation. Very often in that situation, this creation is not connected to the customer problem and you're creating a product that nobody needs and nobody uses it because you came up with something that doesn't exist except in your head. And this is why a lot of startups fail because they don't talk to customers, they don't understand the customers or they want to change their customers and how they work, which is the opposite of what you should do as a founder. You should find a problem that is a big pain and then help people solve it and they will pay you money for your software that does it. Hmm. I think that that strikes a nerve for us uh, because in the first company that we had with Paris, we were building a developer tool. So the primary customer was developers like us. And, uh, you know, this is um, a very good thing to have, but a very bad thing to have as well because, you know, because you're very close to the market, you think that whatever comes to your head, that's the same thing for everyone. Um, And uh, sometimes, you know, you might get ahead of yourself because you might think, okay, you know, I'm a developer. I do X, Y, Z every day. I can do this easier and better for me. It will help, you know, other people like me. But um, although that's, you know, that's a good, that's a good, you know, first step. Yeah. You always have to validate and to to make sure that they will pay for that uh, feature or they, I mean, many people will, if you ask people, do you like this or do you want this? 
they will probably say yes. But uh, if you actually ask them, you know, are you going to pay for this? That's a very different question. Yeah. And this is, you know, very a very common trap that we we see in uh, in companies. And what we ended up doing was a feature factory. So you know, we said, okay, every day we were waking up. Oh, I would like to have X Y Z feature yeah. because it makes my life easier. Boom, new feature in the product. And then you end up, you know, maintaining maintaining a large code base and lots of things. So I I mean, I feel what you're saying and uh, I can definitely see myself being in the other on the other side and yeah. doing the exact that's bad what, thing that you That's what I thought exactly yeah. about it. But you talked before about the ICP, yeah. the ideal customer profile, right? So how do you how do you know that you found the ideal customer profile? Do you is this something that you understand from existing data, or do you make a first hypothesis, a first assumption, and you go and give it and you give it a go? And if it works, then you deduct that this was actually the ICP. Yeah. So no matter who you ask, every person will give you a slightly different answer. Because what about you? <laughs> there are so many different opinions on that, but I think I think this is more qualitative rather than quantitative. Okay. So of course you should back it up by data, but you are not making decisions <clears throat> based on data. What you will observe when you have found an ICP or product market fit, which are very close to each other, is that you start, you the space around you starts to have more gravity. Okay. And especially you start to see push and pull mechanics. So an example of that would be you have a version one, Mm -hmm. that is not optimal and it maybe has some bugs and a lot of limitations, but there is a group of people who continue using it and benefiting from this product. That's a pull mechanic where they are using something that you've built even though it's not ideal. That's a good signal that they might be a customer who fits your profile. Another example would be where people are sending you a lot of ideas and requests how to make things better. Like, you know, you have this product, but I also like to have this reporting, those kind of permissions, those automations and integration, then it will be perfect for me. This is also another space where you have some kind of exchange. Again, a little bit of push and pull where they ask for things and they interact with you. So like I call it gravity. I often use this like physics as a metaphor when I work with startups. Mm -hmm. And when you start to see that there is some kind of interaction, this is a uh, close to ICP. And of course, those people will be similar to each other in terms of their maybe industry or company size or problems that they have or their budgets and ways they work or maybe their geographical location. So you would be able to cluster them and there's going to be a cluster that is very similar, homogeneous, and then it could be a lot of random things which are not your ICP and this cluster probably is. So this is how you feel it. I don't think you can really quantify it and there is no formula or cut off how many people you should be, but then you kind of understand that, yeah, with those people, it's easier to talk about my product. They connect with the value that we deliver. They recognize the value. They're ready to pay for it. Money is a very big, important part of the ICP because it should be, yeah, are you ready to pay for that? It's uh, sometimes no. And then it's not the ICP because it's not a customer if they're not paying you. It's just a user and you you want to have a customer, especially right now with this. Like, so you cannot actually know the ICP before you have paying customers? Well, you will have an idea. You can, you can give it a go. I mean, you might have an idea and try to see if this is true. Yeah. And then they will either pay or not pay. And then you will know for sure. Okay. So you can have a good understanding and have good like idea about it. But again, it will be an idea in your head. And then you need to compare it with the reality if it's actually the case. Okay. So let's say that you start, you know, from the ideal ICP, you have, you know, three versions of it. And then, uh, you know, slowly you, you, you go towards one of the personas and now you know your ICP. So what's it, what's the next step? How do you go from those, you know, five people that kind of make some gravity and uh, around the specific persona, you say, you know, this is the age or company size or, you know, the other uh, metrics and you have, you know, a profile. Yeah. What's, what's the next step? How do you go to 25 or to 100? You need to find your dominant acquisition channel. And for every company, it's going to be different. It could be paid marketing and advertising. It could be partnerships. It could be word of mouth. It could be your network and community. It could be called outreach. It could be inbound or whatever. So there are multiple ways of them. Probably one channel will be your dominant and it will bring you 60 to 80% of your customers will come okay. through that channel. And definitely way more than a half. And then you need to find this channel and develop it. Whatever that is for your business, this is how you get from five to 25, because this is where things start to 
show the first signs of scale. So maybe first five customers you acquire through your friends and network, the next 25 would be nice to have a predictable mechanism how to get them so that you can do it every quarter or hire a person and teach them how to do it and they will be able to get the same results. The channels, roughly speaking, like inbound, outbound, paid or free, there are a few ways to categorize them, but you need to find something that will work for your company. And that really depends on different things. If you talk about, let's say, food delivery, I guess your channel is just people seeing a driver on a motorcycle who is delivering food and they get curious about it. Maybe it's paid advertising. Maybe, so that was a channel for them. For other, let's say, developers, I think community is a very powerful mechanic. And if you know that a lot of developers and you are a speaker at a meetup or a conference, and then you announce that you have this tool that you're building, people will be interested in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So you will use community as a way to get to your customers. So you need to find your channel basically and start developing it and understanding where are your customers. For example, customers have problems and they are trying to find a solution for this problem. And there are different ways, how can you find a solution? You can ask your friend, that means you need to be part of the community. You can Google for it. That means you should be on search. You could um, ask your colleagues. That means you should have word of mouth and so on. Like where people are trying to find an answer to their problem, you should be there. And that would be your marketing or acquisition channel. Then you just develop it to make sure that you have good unit economics and you get enough number of customers and so on. And let's say, okay, if you're like a marketing person, then maybe that's uh, you know you, you know the basics and then you can you can grow on it but uh, many times founders are either you know they know the business very well or they're technical so it's a bit uh, it's a bit more difficult so what would be like an advice would you, you would give to non marketing founders that are trying to uh to go into this growth uh stage i would say talk to your customers and mm -hmm. talk to more prospects and learn marketing because in the <laughs> beginning you should do it yourself you can't really outsource it if you if you don't have this as a part of your dna it's probably not gonna re work really you need to understand your customer really really well so you need to talk to them ask for introductions go to events and you spend as easily as 50 percent of your time talking to customers and trying to figure out who they are where they are what kind of problems what is the best way to talk to them what language they're using when they're talking about prog their problems and adapt to that. So just talk to your customers and everybody who feels like a customer and keep doing that and have a metric of how many customer conversations do I have in a week. Mm -hmm. And maybe at the beginning you have one customer conversation in a week because you don't know anybody, but at some point you will be at five customer talks mm -hmm. in a, every week, which is a good start. And maybe then at some point you'll be able to scale to 10. That means this is a good time maybe to hire a salesperson because if you can get to 10 customer calls in a week, then you can scale it with another person. So that is probably the only advice is for most of the things, like if something doesn't work, you don't have leads, talk to, your, talk to new customers. You don't have people working, using your product, talk to new customers and try to learn. Like almost like 80% of the advice that I give is some form of talk to your customers. Mm. How can you, in 2024, how can you be heard on the internet? Uh, because it's, it's, you have, the the most capabilities than ever you can do every everything pretty much you can have videos on youtube on tiktok on instagram you have linkedin twitter facebook you know all, all that good Not stuff twitter, x x sorry <laughs> yeah. you have you can have your own uh, website newsletters you have all the tools we never had that many tools but there's what, what many people will say is that right now there's too much noise out mm -hmm. there so i can't i can't be heard so how, how do you do that? And is there any timeless way to approach growth and building an audience? Oh, that's a big question. I think that it's good to try and understand what noise actually means. And noise to me is the content that doesn't bring any value. Mm -hmm. It's a repetition or something that I already know and it's very basic. So for me, I just... I see it, I, I really, my, my brain can recognize if it's noise or not, just like yours, within a few seconds. Mm -hmm. And I know if I see a, a person's I know, feed and I read through them some of their messages, I understand if it's like noise and bullshit or it's actually something interesting. Mm -hmm. So for you to be able to become more visible, you need, you need to be the opposite of noise. You need to bring value. And this is a question of creativity. What is one thing that is, doesn't really exist yet, but that would be helpful to your audience. And if you are selling to 
say Python developers, and this is your audience, who are those Python developers? What do they care about? What are their problems? And what of kind of content would they like to hear? Is it more about entertainment and jokes about how all every deployment on Friday goes wrong? Or is it more educational and it's like a long guide? Or is it more comparison of technology, how it can be better? Mm -hmm. Or more? is it more? So you find a topic that resonates with them and that's a fresh topic. And there are plenty of them. Like most of the people, they're actually in the category of I'm, I'm noisy, repetition, regurgitating the same stuff over and over again. And you need to be the opposite of that. And then people will see you, they will interact with your post, they will like, subscribe, and you will become a little bit more visible. And the only way is to just provide high quality content that is helpful to them. Which way you decide, could be entertainment, could be informational, could be educational and so on. Does entertainment work? Yeah. To get customers? You'll be surprised that you can't just do only that, it's impossible, but people respond to jokes really well. And if you have posting funny gifs and some kind of jokes and memes about your work, people actually connect with you on an emotional um, basis and they, they like it because we have so much serious work in our life all the time, 24 seven, everything is super serious, it's revenue, it's growth, it's numbers, mm. that joking about the, the absurdity of everything is quite healthy and a lot of good influencers on LinkedIn that I follow, they quite regularly post um, funny messages that are less serious and they're just, you know, for the sake of a joke. And they, because if you can joke about your industry, it means you really understand your industry well. Mm -hmm. Otherwise your joke is not funny. So people also <laughs> connect with that and they like when people are like a bit meta when it mm -hmm. comes to their profession. Okay. When was LinkedIn better, uh, 2019 or now? I think LinkedIn improved a lot in the last few years. They've done a big improvement on how you discover content and how you can grow your network. Because before that, I just saw posts of friends and anniversaries and like new jobs and so on. Right now it feels like a social um, platform where I can follow experts and I get real examples, cases and advice. And for me, the quality of LinkedIn improved a lot. I also find customers through LinkedIn myself. So it's uh, one social media that works for me. I think it's the only one that really works in professional space. I guess Twitter or X is the other one, but it's slightly different type of content and community. But LinkedIn is definitely the go-to platform for many, many companies and especially people who work in independently or by themselves. So yeah, LinkedIn now is a much better place than it was five years ago. So how do you prefer LinkedIn now or five years ago? So uh, I think we have discussed this, but I think in the Greek version of the podcast. So um, I, I think for me, LinkedIn uh, as a user... John asked us this question, right? Because I wasn't yeah, I sure think, where I got I this question so, yeah. from. So I think LinkedIn as a user, uh, it's a bit more noisy for me now. So it's um, I, I use it less frequently than I was using it <coughs> like maybe one or two years before. But now I have... Um, I mean, I try to to keep my attention to to other things and try to avoid, you know, any kind of social media. Mm. So uh, I'm not very. Um, it, it might it might be uh, related, but uh, in terms of you know, uh, exposing myself uh, both, you know, uh, as myself as a brand, you know, as as the podcast or the company or you know whatever. I think this uh, the gain out of this has been uh, improved uh, dramatic dramatically in the last uh, couple of years. So I think that. Uh, it makes more sense to have a good presence on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, definitely. That stays with you forever. If you change companies, if you start a new business, your network is your network. You can always rely, it's a big resource. And for example, if I need to hire a person in a company and I'm thinking about hiring a senior Python developer, I would be looking for skills that they have in Python. If I would be looking to hire a VP of engineering, of course, the skills are important, but also they're bringing their network because it's mm -hmm. not just what they can do themselves with their time. It's also their knowledge and framework and experience and things that they've done in the past, but also people that they know because I can get access to this VP of engineering and all of the friends that they know mm -hmm. and met across the past. And this is what I actually hire, what I pay for. So if you go, especially for high leadership positions, you should be more than your skills. You should be also your brand and network. That is a big boost to your at least the salary, but also the positions that you will be getting. So what I have found out on LinkedIn is that there are many interactions about work. So we have um, uh, a, a couple of friends of ours that have a UX uh, consultancy. And so one of them was making a point on LinkedIn. And then there, there were people from all over the world talking about that in the comments, which is something that I've not seen 
with a person such clo uh, that close to us on X, for example, or on Facebook. And I was thinking that maybe this is because you you declare your skills on on LinkedIn, so it can maybe it can suggest your content to other people that have similar skills. So this this was quite interesting. So he was writing something about UX, and there were, were UX people around the world that were writing yeah. about it. There, that's pretty the cool. Comments. And I think this is the new thing that appeared in LinkedIn quite recently because they started giving out those badges, such as Top Voice or this like UX um, thought leader and something mm -hmm. like that. And the beauty about LinkedIn that every person is a person. Some of them, of course, are bots, but most of the people they have their CVs. You can see are, where are they work. Are there bots on LinkedIn? Yeah, of course. Everywhere. I mean, I didn't yeah. know about it. I mean, okay, I, I would never think Bolts about it. Bots are everywhere. Yeah. Bots will eat us But not a lot. Not like <laughs> on Twitter, you know, there they have, I don't know, 30% easily could be automated messages and profiles. On LinkedIn, it's much harder okay. to do that. But also, like, every person that you see as a comment or a poster, most let's assume that everybody for the sake of simplicity they're real people with their work history you can see the company that they worked titles that they have and maybe what projects they had and that is a, a very personal and if that person is talking about ux and they have been doing ux for the 10 years you're more likely to believe them rather than a person who is just you know starting a new account and trying to do something on twitter so your cv actually works on you in on linkedin and that's the the cool part about the social network that you have your career history there Okay, so how can a startup founder that working on a SaaS company, software as a service, find customers through LinkedIn? Do you use, I mean, tools like lead generation and all that stuff, which is okay. I guess there are some tool sets, but how can you put out content that can be heard from, from your audience? Yeah, I think that probably LinkedIn will not be your dominant channel to get all your customers through that platform, but you will have multiple interactions with the same customer and they might find you on search and then talk about your to, to the friend that they know and then also check you out on LinkedIn. So there will be multi-touch. And it's very difficult to attribute from marketing if you want to do data, how to attribute which platform brings how many customers and so on. But you will see that if you have a strong presence and visibility on LinkedIn, it will help. So to do that, to get customers, you can't do only LinkedIn. You need to do something else as well. But on LinkedIn, you can provide content. You can write case studies. You can tell that how you optimize the deployment, how you save time and uh, improve the testing pipeline. It was you know 10 minutes of automated testing. Now it's seven minutes because you did that. If you share those kinds of things, they're very interesting because a lot of people can self-study. If they can't self-study, they can ask you for advice and you pay and pay you and do a project with you. So if you share your expertise, which basically means I've done this and I got this result that I can prove in numbers. So if you can showcase this in your post, in your um, video or whatever you do over LinkedIn over a period of time, you develop reputation. And people know that Paris is a guy that we can trust who knows a lot of stuff about Python and automation and uh, you know deployments, for example. And then, oh, yeah, if the, I have a question and somebody asks me, so, oh, check out this guy and his post. It's super helpful. He has also has newsletter. And you can also promote your newsletter on LinkedIn. So developing an expertise or a brand, this is all about. It's, it's the same thing that I mentioned, like how to provide quality content versus noisy content. Noisy content is just clickbait, doesn't bring any value. Real use case examples from operators who are doing this job for a long time and they know the stuff and they share how they work, that's pretty interesting and that's unique. This is something that you can't Google. This is where you hear mm -hmm. on conferences if you go there. But imagine that you are giving a conference talk every week on LinkedIn. And instead of creating a slide deck, you create mm -hmm. a post and share it on LinkedIn with the same purpose of educating something, sharing something about yourself. And this is how you develop a follow followers on LinkedIn. And then they will turn into clients. A followers. Yeah. Ah, I like that word. I, I, I didn't know that word. I think there's like a followship is a, okay. a, a noon that you okay. can use. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I think that um, it might not be like a good channel to, to do like an um, acquisition of completely unknown people, but it's a, you know, a great, a great push after, you know, somebody finds you somewhere then to, to make sure that, okay, yeah, that's my guy. You know, that's, that's a company that I want to, to go work with or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. So if you, for example, have 10,000 followers on LinkedIn and you post regularly and your posts are having more than 100 interactions of like likes, comments or whatever, and you have this like top voice badge and somebody thinks about working with your company, they will check your profile and say, oh, wow, that guy has a newsletter, 10,000 followers and a blue badge of top voice that is given by LinkedIn. I guess he knows his stuff. 
It's so like that's, street credit. I mean. it's, yeah, it simplifies their decision making mm. and reduces friction. Okay, so I, I wanted to follow up on something that we, we were speaking about when we had lunch, which is the ecosystem of technology companies mm-hmm. and how it is in Berlin. So I don't say that, and I, in a previous podcast episode, we discussed about how many people say that Athens has a great tech ecosystem, but we don't believe that it is such. I mean, it, it does have a few companies, but it's like he, here and there. And then we asked you, how is it in Berlin? And you responded like, it's all over. Yeah, like you, it's nonstop. So, yeah, so ca- can you describe how that feels like? Well, you can find the meetup every week mm-hmm. for almost every topic that you have in technology could it be it could be ux it could be ui and design could be devops could be engineering could be leadership could be product management could be marketing sales like almost everything happens on a regular basis and there are multiple smaller groups and bigger groups and events so almost every month you have some kind of conference happening almost every week you have an Every event. month you have a conference? Yeah, I think it's pretty mm. easy to say that and they might not be big. Maybe it's just no, no, one, no. one or two hundred participants, but I wouldn't be surprised that you can find them on a regular basis because so many companies and individuals organize them. It's just, it's happening nonstop. And if you want, you can go to events, I don't know, easily participate in like 100 events in a year. I wouldn't be surprised to be honest if you really want, but it's also a lot. So it feels like it's always happening. There are people who are crazy for information and knowledge. And especially with the pandemic slowing down a little bit, or at least people forgetting about it, they are more comfortable going to offline events that are happening in person. And there they listen to speakers and there are a lot of free events and paid events. And every time, like all the time something is happening. So Berlin is buzzing with technology. You have a lot of investors, accelerators, incubators, startups that are hiring bigger corporates, and everybody is just doing tech work in, in Berlin right now. At least this feels like that for me. Maybe I live in a very specific bubble because I myself work in tech, but to me it feels like it, it's always happening there. What, um, how do you believe this happens? I mean, what are the, the steps that either companies or you know, individuals are taking in order to, to reach this, this point? Because, I mean, this cannot magically happen. I know that you know now that it's happening, it is to to keep going. But how do you do you reach that stage? How I don't know what's the starting point, but basically you have companies who are tech companies and they're hiring people. Those people get hired and then they start to seek for other people who are working in the same profession and they organize and sometimes they self-organize. Somebody notices that and they start to make an event. The people go and join this event and they pay for entry ticket. Maybe it's twenty euros. Um, all that is paired with investors who are giving money to startups so the startups can hire so that this all, all begins. And I know what's the starting point. It's like investors come in here or you have tech companies that appear here and they're first bootstrap or it's just tech people move here because it's a very nice cost of living and it's a good infrastructure. Like, I don't know what's the entry point, but it's a combination of things like a lot of tech companies are here, they're hiring. Those people need to talk to each other and sometimes they just chat informally in bars and and lounges, but they also want to have formal gathering, which is more educational. And of course, that brings an opportunity for sponsorship, promoting your product, creating an event around your brand. And then you have popular companies like Amplitude hosting events in Berlin like every couple of months and they are targeting different profiles. All that starts to work on itself and then more people join companies, more people go to events, more events appear, more sponsors come here, more investors come here because there's more money, more tech companies and founders come here. So like it all starts to work like that. But I think it's a combination of those factors and that creates the ecosystem or a startup scene or feeling that you have right now in Berlin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, as you said, I think from a point onward, it starts to, to be like inherent i mean it's uh it's within the community but uh, you know that to, to get that initial speed i think that's uh that's the most difficult part and uh... i think it can be pushed forward from any direction so if you want to start developing events more people will come to events and if you have a city where you have a lot of tech events it's likely that tech companies will also appear in the city mm-hmm you can do it from an event perspective. You can also do it from a founder perspective. If more founders start to found companies, that means there are more people who work in technology in the city. Could be done this way. Could be done through investors. Like if people who live in, in the city start to invest in tech companies, 
there will be more founders who are attracted to this capital. And this could be done from the founder perspective as well, from the investor perspective, I mean. So I think there are multiple ways of doing that. And whoever, like whichever tribe you belong to, you can contribute to the ecosystem. Okay, so how many how many companies are bootstrapped and how many? I mean, what, what's the ratio of bootstrap and fa- funded companies? I mean, of course, you don't you don't have any numbers of fi- official numbers, but what's uh, h- how do you see? It? What's your take on that? Oh, it's very difficult. I think there are a lot of side projects where people are doing something on top of their full time job, mm-hmm. and I think there's a very big number of projects like that. I don't know if you can call them companies or startups, but it could be one person or a few friends doing something in the evenings or during the weekend. That there are a lot of them like that, and they are bootstrapped or they invest their own money and own time into that. There are, of course, founders who go and raise capital and they have traditional venture uh, way. Mm -hmm. That is also very popular. And this is what we usually hear about, like this company raised, another company raised, and so on. Um, Like completely bootstrapped and successful, I don't, it's probably a very small number because it's difficult. And startups, at least before pandemic and in the beginning of pandemic, they used to have easy access to capital because you could just raise money, hire people, do something, doesn't work, you move on to the next idea and everybody is happy. Right now, everybody is very tight with money, the budgets are being cut, investors don't invest as much because it's economical crisis, it's like wars all over the place, and everybody is unsure what's happening. So. Money is less available right now. So bootstrapping is becoming more popular Mm -hmm. than it is right now because you just can't access money. So you need to be profitable. So it always changes. I have, I probably will not give you numbers, but it feels like before it was way more companies who were raising money. Now it's way more capital uh, companies who are working by themselves and they try to be profitable when they're a team of four or five people. And of course, there are like endless amount of hobby and side project that people just do in the evening. Of course, yes. And those are also bootstrapped, but they just don't lead anywhere. And they might be appearing and disappearing and you, we never know about it. But mm-hmm. probably there are a lot, way more than where people invest. Because if you think from the investor perspective, you say like, I have money, I'm giving it to startups. In the week, you get 1,000 applications. So like there's a lot of people mm. who want your money. It's always been like that. So it's way more companies that don't get funded. And if they don't get funded, either they disappear or they continue to bootstrap. So, okay. but on, on a tighter budget. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's um, I, w- I was th- I was also thinking about right now that it, I find it really interesting that both when the two of us discussed about the tech scene in Athens and you when we asked you about the tech scene in Berlin, a main indicator of how big a tech scene is are the events yeah. and the social life that you can have around your profession and. I was also thinking, why would someone organize or participate in an event? And I understand one of the reasons that you talked about is that companies want to to get in touch with talent and um, f- find, but you know, better better stuff for their company. And people want to join events because they want to meet with other companies and see how they can they can move on. So. You also talked about conferences, which usually are full day events. So how does that usually work there? Do people get a day off to go at a conference or does the company give them an allowance, I mean, to to be there and doesn't count Hmm. towards their day? Do you know how that works? I can give you a few examples from the company that I worked and mm-hmm. they just say, I have an event, it will be in February, it goes for two days, do you mind if I go there? Mm. I'm gonna be online on Slack if you need me, <clears throat> but I will not be able to work, I will be st- studying, let's say, or learning from those speakers. And most of the companies say, yeah, go. And that's not a vacation day and it's just considered your normal work day. Mm. And you say like, bring your laptop with you and maybe we will contact you, but yeah, everybody knows that you're gonna be at this event. So most of the companies that I know, and I consider them like good companies, they allow their employees to go to such events because it's a win-win situation. The employee goes there and learns something, comes back and do their job better. And they can maybe even spread the knowledge with the rest of the team. So it's a good thing. Uh, Some companies pay for those conferences and they have a learning and development budget. And it could be, let's say 500 euros per year or maybe 1000 per year, every employee gets, and they can spend it on conference tickets as well. Mm-hmm. So they can even the, sometimes the company can pay for it or the 
another option would be you can go there and apply as a speaker. So you get a ticket for free, obviously, as a speaker. And this is what I used to do back in my days very often. I like a conference, I just apply as a speaker. If I get accepted, I get the conference for free, which is very nice. And I just need to give a talk, which of course I need to prepare, but I don't need to pay something like 500 or 1000 for the ticket, which is pretty nice. And it's also good for the company because you are giving a talk under the company's name. Mm -hmm. You're probably gonna use your company as an example and talk how you work and what are the good things about it. So you're promoting your company And you can always say in the end, like, you know, our company is hiring JavaScript developers and UI designers. If you are one of these, come talk to me or like go to this website, we are hiring. So that's also a very nice kind of free marketing that you Mm -hmm. don't pay for except with the time that you need to prepare some slides. So usually companies like to do that kind of stuff and they don't mind when their employees and team members go and find events and participate there. I don't know the cases where it would be, no, don't go there. You need to work. You don't have time. Like I would consider this a very bad workplace. And that would be for me a red flag. Like, do you want to stay in a company that doesn't support you in your career growth aspirations? Hmm. Yeah, I think it's a win-win situation because uh, this leads to having better employees because they they learn more, they can have better impact inside the company. And um, of course, at the same time, you get exposure because... uh, those employees, I mean, all those people who will go and socialize. Oh, where do you work? Oh, to yeah, that company. Oh, what do you do? I don't, I don't know that company before. And then you you get exposure, and more people know about it. Maybe they advertise that you have a nice, uh, a nice workplace, so you get more people um, applying when you hire. So I mean, I think that you have. It's not easy to measure that effect because it's. I mean. There are so many different small uh, improvements that you get out of it that you cannot, you know, you cannot have a spreadsheet saying, you know, oh, we got two hires from that conference. You cannot say that. But I think if that if you do it consistently and then you uh, you show that you actually invest in your people, in your uh, presence, then this shows and this uh, uh, greatly improves your future hires, your future uh, presence and everything yeah. as a company. And it's a very powerful mechanic because imagine you go to the conference and you give a talk or you write something on LinkedIn and you get 25 likes. You do it every week, once a week or twice a week. Imagine you do that, what's the impact for your brand? And then think if you have a team of 50 people and then almost everybody is doing that or every other person is doing that and they talk about their work on LinkedIn and they all get 25 likes and 2000 people look at their content. If 25 people do that, that is an insane number of cover that you have with with your uh, free marketing through social media. Of course, it never happens because you can't make sure that everybody in your company posts. But this is the logic that the more people are talking about, and this is uh, like advocacy kind of mechanic, that if your employees talk about your workplace, your workplace gets a better credibility brand and recognition. And Mm -hmm. that helps you with sales, that helps you with hiring, that helps you with partnership, it helps you with everything. It's like a brand. It improves every single conversion that you have. Um, Unfortunately, I've seen at least a few companies that are reluctant to to do so because they're afraid that their employees might might get poached, which is a bit sad because if... uh, if someone wants to leave, you, do, you don't want to keep that person in the company. And yeah. if, if a person is, have, is, is having a good time, because I'm not sure if, if it's the right um, choice of words because it's still a job, but if they are enjoying what they do and they feel fulfilled and that they, there's no reason to, for, for them to leave. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I agree 100% with what you say, but I've seen companies not, not always, you know, picking that direction. For example, we do organize with Antonis the Docker Athens meetup in, Ath- in Athens, of <laughs> course, because, yeah. And um, we send to, we, we know a person and we ask, asked if they would like to do a presentation at the meetup and they responded that, you know, I'm not allowed to do so for my company because we can't talk about the, the code that we have here. Mm-hmm. I go, oh, come on, what the fuck? I mean, n- no, you, you, I don't. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what, what to say about it. I mean, I mean, what? <clears throat> what's the last time any company had business trouble because someone spoke at a meetup? I don't know those cases. I don't know any any of those cases. Yeah, yeah. And 
I also had another question that I wanted to ask you about this ecosystem part. Does it ever happen that you get into a coffee shop in, in Berlin or a restaurant and any, anyone else, I mean, in, in the people being there works in tech? Is this, does this happen often or you don't know? Where you bump people who work in technology? Yes. All the time. Mm. You go and you have a lunch in a restaurant and the table next to you is talking about deployments in Python. Okay. And then you go and you sit in a movie and the people next to you is talking about how they did some uh, tickets and customer support and what kind of interactions they have. So you hear the tech conversations all the time around you. Mm. So that's what it feels like. I mean. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's how it feels like. Okay. I... I, I uh, I always say that uh, again. I said that in the previous podcast, but we we did with uh, Antonis a very you know big jump. So we started our first company here in Athens in 2011, which was uh, the crisis started. I remember, it was yeah, a completely fucked up situation. And then in 2012, we we won at a startup competition here in Athens. We got 10,000 euros and we spent this money to go to San Francisco and meet people there. So it, it was, you know, a huge leap going yeah, from yeah. a company right inside the crisis to San Francisco, which was booming in 2012. Yeah. I think it was at its best. I think so too, yeah. And I remember the difference in the feeling there that you would get, I would get into Starbucks and I would see people having their code editors. Yeah. If this was really, it would happen really often. Anyway, yes. So we're discussing about Rails versus Django or, you know, all those things. And then the people were bumping yes. to us and saying, oh, you know, I did some Rails coding and then maybe yes, you, you some, have to try this or that. Completely strangers and they could, uh, you know, immediately pick up uh, one cue from what you were saying and then uh, yeah. try yeah. to help or, you know, share an opinion. Do people come from other countries to Germany to work uh, in tech? But when I say from other countries, I mean from countries that you usually expect people to go to. So, I mean, do you have Germ uh, um, yes. Americans coming to Germany to work? Some, yeah. So it, it happens from time to time. It happens, yeah, because I had a few American colleagues and I asked them the same question, like, why did you move from US to, um, to Europe? And they just said, I wanted to have a different lifestyle. For me, Europe was a little bit more relaxed and laid back and you have better work-life work -life balance and you have better securities when it comes to, let's say, unemployment, medicine, and so on. Like mm -hmm. in the US, you have your box and then you're out in, in, in a day. <laughs> That's it, you're fired. In Germany, it's very difficult to fire a person. So this, they sometimes want to move here because they have family or they want to have a different lifestyle. And for them, Europe is a nice place. And I have quite a few Americans who sh shared this kind of story with me when I asked them, why did you move from US? I have a completely different question to ask. So if you yeah. have an, uh, a question to the top. So I have, I have one last thing to point out. For me, it's what I don't understand is how in the US they take greater risk than in Europe. Because exactly for that reason that you pointed out, you have many more securities here. In yeah. Europe. So... At least in theory, you can take m many more risks because there's much less to lose. I mean, it's it's harder to lose everything here. So you 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 should try even more. In, I mean, at least in my head. But uh, seems like this does not happen. I don't understand why. But I do me notice. neither. Yeah, I think it's cultural. It's probably a thing that has been developing for a long time and people are in a comfortable spot and they say, okay, that works for me. I'll just continue doing like that because I like it. I guess that's the attitude. I don't really know the real answer to that, but I think risk averseness or like how you, how adventurous you are, it's mostly a cultural thing that you have or like at least familial thing on that level. So I would like to completely change the topic. And uh, so you, you talked about uh, you being a product person or you know your yeah. craftsman's, uh, craftsmanship is, uh, is product, but you know a lot of things about marketing, you advise startups. So how did you end up here? You know, how how did this story evolve? And you know, where did you start and how did you uh come to where you are today? Okay. So this is what I usually say if I would be doing through going through an interview. So oh. <laughs> basically, right? I say like I studied computer science in the university and I really liked I always was good with technology, informatics, and that was I enjoyed computers a lot. I played computer games and then I started to play around with like what actually how computers work. And during my university years, I started to work as a PHP developer. That was my first 
professional career and something that I, I got paid for. I did that for a few years, got better, became a senior PHP developer, then became a team lead, then became a director of engineering. So my first five or six years of career was in engineering. And I was coding websites on PHP, JavaScript, and MySQL. But at some point I realized <laughs> that I really like thinking about the feature and how that would lo look and work, but I don't really enjoy the coding part because it's much slower. And like I can come up with a with the interface and exactly what I need to do. And then it will take me one week to code it. It's like, okay, that's a bummer. <laughs> so I decided to focus on the thing that I enjoy, which is thinking about the features and the customers and the interfaces. And I learned that at the time it's called product management. Said, okay, that's actually what I want to do. So I moved from engineering to product management. And to me, it felt like a parallel track because as a, especially as a director of engineering, I was already doing product management as my job. It was just not the only activity that mm -hmm. I had. And then I said, okay, I want this to be the only activity that I'm doing. And then I moved them directly into product and that happened around 10 years ago. After that, worked in various startups, small scale, big scale. I worked in hiring and recruitment uh, startup. I worked in cloud computing startup, worked in micromobility and scooters, in B2B SaaS, different, different stories, in FinTech as well for a while. And at some point I learned that inside product management, there are different specialties. Like you have a designer and then you can have a UI designer, UX designer, you can have marketing designer, you have motion designers and like all of them are different types of designers. Same with product management. You have different types of product managers. And there are types like I'm a classical product manager who's developing features. There is an innovations product manager who is bringing things from zero to one. There is a platform product manager who makes sure the things are working together and they scale nicely. And there is a growth product manager who is optimizing conversions and funnels and things about monetization, pricing, and so on. I really got interested into this part and I specialized in growth. And then I decided to make, again, though, from all of, all of the activity that I'm doing, I want to keep growth and make this 100% of my occupation. So I specialized in growth. That happened maybe three years ago or something like that. Mm -hmm. And started working with growth. Uh, that was my full-time job. Started working with um, in the community, talking about it, going to work uh, conferences, webinars, podcasts, and so on, talking about growth, about product management, about leadership. And one eventually started working with startups and founders directly. And again, I did the same exercise. I realized that the part that I like the most is me talking with founders, and that would be, let's say, 20% of my activity. So I decided to make it 100% of my activity and skip everything else, which would be day-to-day -day growth product management kind of work. So I did it multiple times in my career, from engineering to product, from product to growth, from growth to advisory, and this is where I'm right now. I don't know if I'm going to do it again. Like that happens usually every five years that mm -hmm. I reevaluate my profession and I like narrow it down and specialize to the thing that I enjoy the most and I drop everything that I don't, don't enjoy anymore. So we'll see. I just, you know, this is my latest evolution. I don't know what kind of Pokemon I will be in five years. So we'll, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so it's more or less uh, the same as you said about customer profile. So you, every time you, you have like a, a box of potential customers and then you try to define which you enjoy working the most because it's not easy to scale your time. Or I don't know if you know any secrets, but if you do, uh, please, sir. <laughs> but if you cannot uh, scale your time, then you can focus your time yeah. uh, more into into that area that enjoys that you enjoy the most. Yeah, and I was always thinking about my my career, and I wanted to be good with my professional life and get well paid. And I want to say, okay, what is the good way of being employed and get a good salary? I didn't really think a lot about being a founder and creating a business, but if I'm an employee, I want to be a unique, but well-desired professional. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to be a generic person that I will be competing with 1,000 other, I don't know, Python developers. That's not my way. But I want to specialize on something that is very, very needed, maybe not by every company, but if the company needs it, they will want a person like me. And I found that is growth. Not a lot of companies are understanding or doing growth, but if they do, they need those people and they're ready to pay well. So I, this was my trajectory. How can I be very unique so I can differentiate, but also very well desired by a very specific segment? So I guess that was my product market fit from mm. the professional perspective. <laughs> because it's the same thing. Actually, your, your professional self is a product. Yeah. Because you, you have to communicate what you, what's the value that you have to offer, actually. Yeah. 
And you can think about it this way because yes, you are your own product. You have your values, which could be your skills or could be your network or frameworks that you're doing or courses that you're leading. And then you also have your own pricing and you can sell yourself with a salary or it could be a consultancy or advisory contract, a project. You have your own, yeah, customers and fit with them. You, you can think about it this way. So we were talking again about this at lunch. What's the difference between an advisory and consultancy? I think that advisory is where you come in and you do basically executive coaching. You help company get better and your client is the company overall. And usually that's the founding team. And say, okay, what is the thing that hurts the most? I will help you and advise on that, but I give you only strategic guidance. I'm not doing work myself. It's not hands-on. Not hands-on, no. It's mostly strategic guidance. Okay. And that would be weekly or bi-weekly sessions that you have, calls or workshops, and, and so on. That would be the format. And consultancy, the way I uh, do it, like mm -hmm. define it for myself, is where you have a well-defined project that mm -hmm. you come and you deliver it yourself. And that could be, I will integrate a new analytics platform in your system and I will do it myself. I will need your developers to code one, th one or two things here, but I will define and configure everything myself. And that's a project. And the project has a time and a scope, and then it has an invoice, basically. Advisory is mm -hmm. a more free collaboration where you need guidance and a person who you can talk to and validate your ideas and strategy and plans. And what's an agency? I guess an agency is the consultancy that is doing the same type of projects all the time. Okay. So you found a vertical and then you... Yeah, that's basically two models that I have. I can work as an advisor, which is a strategic advising of your company, and I can do consultancy or agency work, which would be very specific, well-defined projects. Okay. I do both. Okay. And how do... I mean... Where can people find you? Do, you? do you have a website? Do you use mostly LinkedIn? How do people reach out? It's mostly LinkedIn and then word of mouth. So some people that I work with, they know other people and founders know founders, investors know investors, and they sometimes can recommend me. So usually through the network, because I've been doing this whole thing, let's say, even if we do the cutoff at product for around 10 years, and I've met, I don't know, thousands of people from this industry, and all of them are on my LinkedIn, and I have a lot of followers and a lot of connections. So if I... I did this, I typed product and then first level connections. People who have product in their title, I think I ended up with 900 people. Oh, okay. So it's a lot. Nice. So yeah, this is what I accumulated throughout my 10 year of career. So if I reach out to them for a coffee, with some of them are friends, some of them are even forget who they are already. <laughs> and mm -hmm. we lost touch because we worked maybe eight years ago and it was like very brief connection. But it's a lot. And I can use my network to find uh, recommendations, new clients, and then... Sometimes, you know, I come here and we record the podcast. Maybe someone will listen to it and then will reach out to me. That happened. I had diff weird, like, customers coming from completely unexpected directions. And it's, it's hard to predict whatever will work, but network works. So I guess this is my, my go-to method is to keep growing and nurturing my, my own network. Amazing, yeah. yeah, and I uh, will definitely put uh, your LinkedIn uh, in you. the show notes as well. And, uh, and your course, if you have it ready. Yeah, yeah. We will have a link to the course. It so will already we'll... be ongoing, but we will run it again, I'm pretty sure. Okay. D okay. Danny has to, to provide the link now. Now he, you're obligated yeah. to yes. find some. Yeah, and I don't have a personal website. I was always thinking about it. I tried to build it on VIX, but it didn't really bring me any clients, so I dropped it at some point because LinkedIn was basically my website and still okay. is. Okay. Amazing. Cool. I, mean, um, I don't know about you, Patty, but uh, I think I learned a ton. Uh, yes, sure. I actually asked all the questions that I didn't no, have nice. time to ask <laughs> nice. in this presentation. That's the best part about running a podcast. You can talk to people that you like and you can ask the questions that you want to get answers. That's and true. then it's very egoistic, but also very nice for the community as well. I mean, it, it's not just about me. I mean, I could ask everything, you know, at lunch again, but yeah. I choose to do it here so other people can hear about it and you can get some exposure because it's a good thing to... Um, to talk about, you said it, it's it's good to talk about the things that you're expert at or the, the things that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Because that's what makes you actually different. Yeah. Cool. cool. Thank you, guys. Great. Cool. Thank uh, you. So you, now the last part is that uh, you can uh, uh, propose one or multiple things. I mean, you're a guest, so you, you have superpowers if you want to. Uh, so we'd like to go first or last in uh, proposing something like a blog post, podcast, course, whatever you want. Book, whatever. Okay, I can go first. Sure. Let's go. So I can recommend two books that um, made a big impression on me and helped me develop professionally. One of them is a book about leadership and it's called Multipliers. 
I don't remember the subtitle, but something about how certain leaders are multiplying others and uh, other leaders are diminishing people. Mm -hmm. That was a very data-driven analytical book and study about how certain leaders are just good at leadership and what it actually means leadership. And that book opened a lot of interesting like thought avenues for me and I re-evaluated how I am managing people. So Multipliers um, is a really good book. We can of course link it in the, in yeah. the notes. And the second one is, I think, really helpful for startups and people who work in startups. It's called Culture Map. And it's a book about different types of personalities and cultural differences between, let's say, European people or even specifically like, the Germans and French. And they go through about different dimensions, like how people give feedback, how people make decisions, how people treat time, if it's flexible or precise, and so on. And there are maybe eight or nine dimensions. And then they see how different cultures in different countries are doing that from US to Brazil to Europe and East Asia and so on. Very interesting, especially if you work in multicultural startup. That helped me a lot when I moved to Europe and I was able to understand what kind of culture I am actually coming from and what I'm taking for granted. Let's say how I give feedback, which is mm -hmm. might be a little bit too direct and too offensive compared to the way people give feedback in Europe, which is a little bit softer and maybe wrapped up in a compliment, something like that. And we, I guess in Northern Europe, because... Uh... <laughs> maybe, maybe, you know? And this is where you start to discover, oh, I never knew like that. And I have a guy who is uh, from the Southern Europe on my team, and that's why he's working like that. So this is the second book, Culture Map. I really, really liked it. I sent, presented as a gift to a few of my friends. They also liked it, so highly recommend it. Okay. So um, I will suggest people to read Getting Real by mm -hmm. 37 Signals, which is also free online. For me, it was a super useful book to understand that how to set priorities in in products and cut the bullshit and then go and launch the thing that's important as fast as you can. And yeah. it's it was a great, a transformative book for me. Okay, I was going to, to propose something different, uh, but uh, you all propose intellectual things. So I will go with um, No Rules Rules, which is uh, yeah. a book by uh, Netflix. I would say that... Uh, Maybe from the middle onwards, a bit repetitive. So, I mean, I think that you get the main the main point pretty early on, but it was uh, quite nice to see how they used it in in a company that was transforming itself uh, at the same time. So it was... Uh... Yeah, Netflix is a very interesting company. I know a guy who's a, their VP of product, used to be for a long time. And the stories that he told about Netflix were just fantastic. So many things that they learned in a very practical way, like not something that you read in a book. Netflix is a very interesting company to see how they work on the inside. Also, I think just in 2023, they stopped sending uh, DVDs. It was, yes. Yeah, uh, yes. I guess DVDs, they killed sorry, it, no. yes. Yes, the last DVD was sent uh, last year. Ah, yeah. Okay. Amazing, amazing. I didn't know that. So yeah, Danny, thanks a lot again uh, for spending your, your time with us uh, in here and for all the nice insights. Thank you for having me, guys. It was a big pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. See you. Um, see you. Bye, everyone.